Good time to start. Welcome back from the break. It's a, a great pleasure for me to introduce now the second speaker of the day, Matthias Niepert. Matthias is from NEC Labs Europe. He, his research interests are in relational learning, learning on graphs, learning with graphical models. He's doing extremely interesting work in this domain. He did his PhD at Indiana University Bloomington, um, then had post postdoctoral uh, stays at the University of Mannheim and the University of Washington. And then he joined NEC Labs Europe, where he had a very steep career. He, after a few years, he is now the manager of the machine learning group uh, there, so a stellar career. Uh, we are very happy to welcome him here to, today and to learn about these exciting topics. You remember in Fabian Theis's talk, also this work on graph data and relational data was highlighted as one of the, the, the next challenges in the field. So I welcome you here, uh, Matthias. It's great to have you. But before you start, I also want to mention that you are co-founder uh, of several open source digital humanities projects, such as the Indiana Philosophy Ontology Project and the Linked Humanities Project. Also, I also want to give credit to the, these activities of yours. It's great to have you here. And uh, we, we are now looking forward to your talk. Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for, for inviting me. Um, it's, uh, you know, looking at the, the set of speakers, it's, it's an amazing symposium. My, my imposter syndrome is going really strong today. Um, so my, my talk will be about, uh, yeah, neuro, neuro relational learning and, and some biomedical applications. And as Carsten said, I'm uh, the, the manager and also the chief scientist uh, at NEC Laboratories Europe. Uh, NEC is a Japanese um, IT company uh, with a lot of different um, you know, areas of, of applications, of use cases. So um, uh, yeah, one of them being uh, in the biomedical domain and specifically in uh, you know, drug development. Uh, before I start, I also want to uh, you know, credit uh, my collaborators, so the machine learning and uh, biomedical AI groups at NEC Labs, and specifically also um, Alberto, Brandon, Caroline, and Timo, who have worked a lot on the types of uh, you know, projects that I'm going to present to you today. Um, so the, the first question uh, that I want to answer here or, or, or you know, uh, elaborate on is uh, why does uh, an IT company like NEC uh, care about, um, you know, graph data and specifically uh, in the biomedical domain? Um, so here you can see four different types of graphs that we have specifically worked on in the past, you know, two to three years. So we work quite a bit with uh, patient uh, data. Uh, so NEC is a big uh, software vendor for uh, so software for uh, medical records in, in Japan specifically. Um, uh, chemical compounds, of course, can be represented as a graph. Um, then we've worked quite a bit with um, biomedical knowledge graphs, where the nodes of the graph are things like the drugs, uh, proteins, um, and also diseases, and the way that they interact, and there can be many different types of interactions. And then also specifically some, some project that I'm going to talk about today as well is a network of, of peptides. So in this particular case here, neoantigens, where we want to learn uh, something about um, neoantigens that can tell us you know, how likely will they elicit Im immune response uh, in, in cancer patients. And so um, as you can see now, we have this, this you know, natural way of representing uh, biomedical or medical data as graphs. And now the big question is, you know, how can we apply um, machine learning methods to, to these graph structured data sets? Um, here I should also make a disclaimer, um, you know, my um, kind of my overview of graph based machine learning is, is quite uh, narrow and biased. So, uh, you know, mach machine learning for graphs has a long history and this is specifically also, uh, you know, the history of, of, of kernels for graphs that Carsten has worked on a lot. So I just want to mention that my, my, my view here is, is, is quite biased uh, on recent methods of using neural network-based machine learning methods for, for graph structure data. So let's go uh, through a couple of examples, right, of how we have used, um, uh, you know, representation learning for graphs uh, for different data sets in the biomedical domain. So for instance, uh, in drug discovery, right, obviously chemical compounds, as I said before, can be represented as graphs. 
And the problem here is now taking a set of graphs or so maybe a big database of chemical compounds and mapping these graphs into a vector representation so that you can downstream classify these, these graphs or perform a, um, a, you know, a solve a regression problem over them. Um, the second type of problems that we typically encounter is that we have, uh, for instance, um, you know, tabular data, so you know, patient medical records. Uh, then we induce a graph representation on top of this. Um, and then we apply graph neural networks to node representations again. And in this particular case, we learn node representations only and perform the node classification. So in our example here, we might be interested uh, to predict uh, you know, uh, things like discharge destination, length of stay, and in hospital mortality for the patients that are the nodes in this graph. And that's a very typical, uh, you know, the, the, the typical uh, uh, target problems for patient outcome prediction that, that are quite important uh, in the, in the uh, medical domain. Um, similarly to the, the previous example, uh, we might also have you know, certain biomedical entities in this particular case here, peptides, so new antigens, um, and uh, we have particular measurements about them. Um, and we also now want to represent these peptides as a graph. Uh, and then learn vector representations for the peptides so that we can perform in this particular case here, for instance, uh, a ranking of, of epitopes according to how likely they are to elicit an immune response in, in, a, can, in a cancer patient. Um, and then finally, um, you know, we might also be interested in learning representations for nodes and edges, right? So if we might have this, I mentioned this before, a biomedical knowledge graph, um, where we have drugs and, and proteins, for instance, and different types of relationships between them. And then we might be interested to, to predict missing links in this graph, right? And so one particular type of missing link could be, you know, are two drugs, if you take them together, uh, more likely to cause a severe side effect, uh, um, which if you took these drugs individually actually wouldn't, wouldn't show up, right? So then here the, the problem is now the problem of, of link prediction in graphs. And so, um, you know, this was just to give you an example of the different types of, um, of uh, prediction problems that you can address when you are given a graph. Of course, what I haven't really told you is um, how to actually do this. So, right, well, what have people done here in the past and in, in, in recent years? Um, there is, of course, a large body of literature. So the, the, the area of graph neural networks uh, in machine learning is growing tremendously. I would say there are probably uh, hundreds of paper per month coming uh, uh, per month coming out. Um, and so I will try now to, uh, on a high level, um, kind of, you know, categorize and, and sort a bit um, these different approaches for you. And then also show in two instances um, how we have used, uh, you know, graph-based machine learning in a particular biomedical application. So the way that I like to start, uh, you know, explaining uh, graph-based machine learning um, um, and specifically neural network-based graph-based machine learning is to start with the success story of convolutional networks for images, right? An image can be looked at as a grid graph. And what the convolutional neural network does, it, it, it kind of moves uh, you know, a small local kernel, typically like three times three pixels from left to right and top to bottom over this image, and then reads off that information. And by now stacking uh, more and more layers, it, it starts off with this kind of local, very local representation um, of the image and then builds more and more global feature representations uh, for the images. And this uh, works extremely well, right? So the nice thing about images, I mentioned this before, is that the, uh, an image can be represented as a regular graph, so a grid graph. So the big question now for arbitrary graphs is where a notion of top, you know, top to bottom and left to right really doesn't exist, is what are good local structures um, that we can use as a substitute for this you know, square shaped grid that we are using in convolutional neural networks for images. And when you look at the literature, you can kind of see three different types of uh, local structure that's been used. Uh, one is uh, triples, uh, one is paths or random walks that are being extracted from the graph and then used as the local structure that on top of which we had learned more global feature representations and then finally also, uh, you know, K-hop neighborhoods of nodes, where we are aggregating information uh, of the neighborhood of a node to recompute or update um, the, the vector representation of the node itself. 
And I want to go into two of those um, uh, you know, areas and, and specifically also how we have used uh, those uh, you know, types of uh, graph-based machine learning methods in, in the biomedical domain. Um, so this one here is you know, this, the, the classical example of uh, representing uh, a knowledge graph actually as a three-dimensional tensor, right? So what you can do is uh, you have, obviously you have your entities like drugs and, and proteins in this particular case, and you have relationships between them. So you can represent essentially a knowledge graph as a set of triples, right? Subject relation, object triples. And now the way that this can be represented and this go, goes back to, you know, result from 2011 is essentially as a, as a three dimensional tensor where every element in the tensor is one um, if that particular entity, that particular triple is true. Um, and so the typical approach in what's called, you know, tensor factorization based, um, um, you know, uh, knowledge graph embedding methods, uh, the way that this works is that you usually choose um, a representation or an encoding for the entities and relationships. In this particular case of Rascal here, which is the first method who has done this, uh, is that we choose uh, vector representations for our entities. Um, and we are choosing a matrix representation for um, the relation type. Uh, then we are choosing a scoring function, um, and there are many now uh, out there. Uh, the idea of a scoring function is that um, you're essentially combining the vector representations of the entities, and in this case, the matrix representation of the relationship into a score. And then finally, you choose a loss function that um, makes um, the scores of um, you know, the triples that you know to be true to be higher than those triples that you don't know anything about, right? And then you train the model and what you are doing implicitly here is you're factorizing now um, this three-dimensional tensor that's, that's representing in this case here biomedical knowledge graph uh, you know, into uh, different parts. And now if you have a new, if you wanna do relation prediction, what you're doing is you're giving now um, you know, this particular relation, this particular triple that you want to know if it's true or not uh, to the scoring function. And if the score intuitively, if the score is high, it's more likely that the triple is true than if the score is low. And um, yeah, so what, what's been happening in this uh, you know, area of work is that over the last you know, 10 years, uh, you know, people have proposed more and more different types of scoring functions essentially, right? So starting with Rascal in the beginning, now there are many, many different more of these scoring functions, but the basic idea is always, we are combining vector representations of entities and relationships into a score and we train now that score to be high for triples that we know to be true. Okay, so now can, so, so given that we can now do a link prediction uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a knowledge graph, how can we actually use this now, for instance, in drug discovery? Um, so for instance, which combination therapies may result in severe adverse events, right? Or which proteins are strongly associated with a particular disease? or which entities in different biomedical databases are actually the same, right? So all of these questions can actually be answered uh, using uh, link prediction. And so the typical process that we are following typically in, 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 you know, in, in our company is to first create the knowledge graph from, from biomedical uh, uh, databases and other types of sources. Uh, this is something that is not to be underestimated as, as a problem, right? So a lot of people focus on the method development this is a really important step is to get a really good and comprehensive and clean uh, knowledge graph representation of your particular domain that you might be interested in. Uh, one of the things that we specifically also do is uh, we have developed a method that can uh, extract and incorporate rules. Uh, so in addition to this kind of factorization based method that I mentioned to you before, uh, we also extract rules. Uh, and we might also uh, uh, enrich the knowledge graph with additional modalities such as for instance, sequence data or um, yeah, other types of data sets, text. Um, then we train our graph machine learning model um, for the different data modalities and predict um, finally the missing relationships between the entities in the graph. And just to go through one example here. So for instance, if we want to build a knowledge graph um, uh, to predict polypharmacy side effect, um, we can go to different uh, biomedical databases we are collecting um, you know, information about um, you know, the entities in this, in this uh, biomedical knowledge graph and also the relationships between them. Um, we enrich it with you know, additional uh, uh, features, uh, for instance, from the gene ontology um, or from other types of, of biomedical sources. 
Um, and then uh, we apply our rule-based method. Um, so the idea here is really that you can um, now, given this large uh, biomedical knowledge graphs, you really apply a rule mining method um, that tells you something or that, that, that results in particular rules that say something like, you know, if drug A and drug C both target a particular protein B, so for instance, they both upregulate a particular protein, then A and C may have a side effect together, right? Um, and these rules are now combined with the type of factorization-based method that I mentioned to you before, uh, and other types of, of, of modalities that might be associated with the nodes in this graph um, into a joint uh, uh, you know, machine learning model. And so the core idea here is that for different types of modalities, different types of feature types, you can choose different types of encoding functions. So for instance, for molecules, you might choose a graph neural network, for, you know, the, this might, they, they might be associated with a drug node, obviously, right? So the chemical compound of the drug. Um, you might also have, um, you know, sequence data associated, for instance, with the proteins um, in, the, in the graph. And for each of those, you choose an appropriate um, encoding function, right? And there are many out there right now uh, to do the way that you can uh, pick and choose. Um, then you aggregate, essentially, the information from these different modalities you concatenate or you, you average, so it's some sort of aggregation mechanism. And then again, you go back to you know, what I presented to you before, you apply this, this um, scoring function uh, to make um, you know, uh, the score of, of, of triples that you know are true in your knowledge graph to be higher than the score of other triples. And we did this and we, we are doing this in many different contexts. So for instance, we are doing this in, uh, you know, as, I, as I mentioned before, polypharmacy side effect prediction um, where we um, you know, uh, are interested in understanding which drugs, if taken together, might cause um, severe, severe side effects. And we show that our method uh, does really well and outperforms other uh, previous uh, state-of-the-art methods here. Uh, but we can also ask, and I mentioned this before, uh, questions such as uh, which of the proteins are actually strongly associated with a particular disease, right? And here we also can compare with um, you know, uh, existing more traditional uh, network-based um, you know, machine learning methods. And we can show that we're really doing quite well here um, with respect to these, um, yeah, these prediction problems. The nice thing, and, and this is something that I should mention here is also that um, uh, I mentioned that we are extracting these rules, right? And so um, you know, one of the nice uh, you know, side effects of extracting these rules is that uh, we can actually look at the model when it makes the, these predictions. So when it, for instance, tell us, it tells us, you know, this protein I think is really associated with the disease. It also provides rules that we can actually inspect and take a look at. So this is something that we found quite important. And actually what we did is, especially also for, for, the, for the polypharmacy problem, is that we could look at the rules and we could actually find some, in some cases in the literature, um, you know, evidence that the rule uh, uh, found something meaningful, right? So that, for instance, uh, a certain upregulation happened uh, that, that uh, was not really explicitly modeled in the knowledge graph uh, that was essentially predicted. And then it could be verified in the literature that that was actually uh, really, really correct, a correct prediction. So this kind of explainability component of, of using also in including rules in these um, uh, matrix factorization methods is something that we found is, is, is quite important. Okay, so this was kind of the first part of, um, I know the first type of uh, um, you know, machine learning model that can be used and, and, and what we've been using it for. Um, the second one is uh, the class of machine learning models and for graphs that are based on, on neighborhoods. So where we aggregate uh, neighborhood information into uh, a new vector representation of the, of the node that we are looking at currently. Um, and so the idea here is that, um, you know, there are, of course, now a huge number of, of graph neural networks, but one large class of, of graph neural networks can be unified with what's called a message passing neural network. Um, and here the idea is that what we do is we are computing uh, node vector representations, so the, the, the vector representations of nodes, recursively by aggregating uh, neighborhood information. Um, so again, uh, one of the things that we would choose is we would say we want our you know, message passing neural network to have a particular depth k, for instance. And then what we do is 
at each step, we are um, looking at the particular node i and its vector representation. And we compute it as first looking at the neighbors of the node i, so all of the neighbors j, their vector representations from the previous depth. Um, then we apply a learnable function h. So these are the, this is the function that has learnable parameters here. Um, we then aggregate the resulting vector representations of the neighboring nodes. And this is a crucial step, right? Because in a graph, we might have for every node in the graph, you know, a different set or a different number of neighbors and the structure of the neighborhoods also might be completely different. So here we have to choose an aggregation that is equivariant or invariant uh, to, to, for instance, the number of neighbors. And then finally, this function G, which is also learnable, combines the vector representations of our node I in the you know, previous depth K minus one with this newly aggregated representation of the neighborhood of the node I. And now all we need to do is we need to specify some labels for the nodes, for some of the nodes in the graph. And then we can train the parameters um, of this graph neural network um, end to end, right? And, and uh, then make, uh, and then predict uh, the class labels for the nodes where the class label is, is, is missing. And because this might be not 100% intuitive, um, you know, just based on the formula here, um, I, I personally like kind of this insight that um, what essentially happens in a graph neural network is that uh, for every node in the graph, what happens is that the neighborhood is unrolled into a directed acyclic computation graph um, that can then be used in a standard, you know, uh, deep learning framework type of way, right? So for instance, if we are looking at a particular two layer graph neural network, and we now want to look at the computation graph that's constructed for the yellow node that you see on the left here, what is happening is that you first look at the, because it's a two layer graph neural network, you're looking at all of the nodes, um, you know, that are two layers away those uh, vectors representations are aggregated, um, combined. And so now we have a new vector representations for the one hop neighbors of the yellow node. And then uh, in the second step, um, we aggregate the you know, one hop, the representations of the one hop uh, neighbors into the new vector representations of our yellow node. And then on top here, when we are at, at, at training, we are applying a loss function and can then back propagate essentially through this uh, computation graph, right? So this is, I think, a nice intuition of what's really happening uh, uh, in these in these graph neural networks. And so now, what uh, you know, what have we actually done? Um, you know, how have we used um, this particular class of, of graph uh, neural networks? Um, so one of the and, and again, I, I should mention here, right, that I'm a machine learning person. Um, so uh, I'm not uh, an expert in the in the biomedical domain. That's why I'm you know working with other people who who are experts here. But on a high level, um, what you do when you are trying to design cancer vaccines is that you're trying um, to understand which of the antigens uh, in a cancer cell will elicit an immune response, because then you could essentially through um, for instance uh, you know a vector based um, you know. Uh, Im Im immune elicitation, you could essentially teach the immune system to then um, uh, attack the cancer cells through uh, this particular um, new antigen, right? So neo here meaning that it's an antigen that uh, is uh, developed in, in within a particular um, mutated cell. And so the idea is that when um, a new antigen undergoes a, a the different processing steps uh, from you know, uh, transcription to um, cell surface pre uh, presentation and receptor binding, that there are different stages. And for each of these different stages, we might be able to collect uh, features, right? That tell us something about um, this particular um, new antigen. And that's exactly what, what we do in our work. So, so we are collecting this type of information. Some of that information is, is publicly available in, in many different, um, you know, um, also biomedical databases, biomedical studies. In other cases, we, 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 we get it ourselves. And so now what we do is we are now looking at, you know, these epitopes. So again, epitopes here, peptide and new antigen, you can think of our, you know, one and the same thing in this context here. And so the idea now is that we are building now this, um, you know, graph representations of these uh, new antigens, these peptides, for which we have at least one piece of experimental evidence. 
And that's kind of the crucial point here, right? So it's, it's very expensive in many cases. And in many cases, we only have very few data points uh, for these, um, these peptides. Um, so the nice thing about this graph representation, I'll, I'll go a, a bit more into, into the details in a second here, is that we don't need um, for every peptide to have all of this uh, possible set of measurements, right? So we might just have one measurement, for instance, for one particular peptide, and we can still include it in this, uh, in this data set. Um, the edges uh, can be constructed be between the peptides in, uh, in many different ways. So one of the ways that we've tried is to use a Blossom 50, so it's kind of, you know, to, to apply some sort of sequence similarity measure between um, um, the, the peptides. Um, and then again, we have this, you know, what we like to call multimodal peptide graph, where we have the nodes are the peptides, the new antigens, and we, we do have for, 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 for them at least one of these measurements, right, that I mentioned in the, in the previous slide. Okay, and then we have a particular graph neural network that we really like to use, which we call embedding propagation. So this is something that, you know, we published, uh, you know, about, about three years ago in Europe's. Um, <clears throat> which is essentially kind of an unsupervised version of this kind of graph new message passing graph neural network um, that I explained in, in the previous slides. So how do we use this now, right, for, um, for predicting or for ranking, uh, you know, new antigens in, and according to what the likelihood is that they will actually elicit an immune response. So we start with our input data. Again, these are the, the you know, the peptides and the, the different types of measurements. And you can think of it as whenever you see, a, you know, this colorful circle there, it means that we have a measurement available. Um, the cross uh, means that uh, there is data missing. So this particular feature type is not available for this particular peptide. Uh, we then uh, induce um, a similarity graph, an affinity graph, um, we've also been working in recent um, uh, years on actually uh, including the graph learning in an end-to-end -end, uh, pipeline. But in this particular case here, we would again do it based on, for instance, sequence similarity. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what we then do is essentially, um, again, we, we look at a particular node, right? This is what happens when we are now training this graph neural network. We are looking at a particular node, a particular peptide. And what we do, which is a bit special uh, in our approach, is that we're actually learning a vector representation for the features that are available for the peptide. And we are learning a separate feature representation for the missing values. So what, what is missing for this particular peptide? We then aggregate these two different feature representations and apply a contrastive loss. So the intuition here is that um, for a particular peptide, we want its uh, vector representation to be similar to the vector representation of the neighboring peptides, right? And so now we can run this message passing neural network scheme. And uh, by running this, we're essentially propagating now um, this information. And while we are propagating this information, we are actually performing an imputation in embedding space. So when we are finished learning, uh, when we're finished training this model, what we end up with is for each of those feature types that we might be interested in, we do actually have um, a, a vector representation, right? So before we had missing values there, but now we do have for each of those feature types a vector representation. And what I should also mention here, which is quite crucial, is that we are still, um, we can still distinguish. So we are not just, you know, lumping everything into one vector representation. We can still distinguish, um, you know, different types of vector representation corresponding to different types of features. Um, that uh, we uh, might have, uh, you know, uh, uh, for the particular uh, new antigen. And so now we don't have any missing values anymore. We have these embeddings, these different types of embeddings. And now we can just, you know, again, concatenate the, these embeddings and train a standard of the shelf, uh, you know, white box, even if, 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 if that works, uh, supervised model, uh, and can use that to make uh, predictions, right? Um, for instance, how, uh, you know, how well the uh, particular peptide might uh, elicit an immune response. Um, so we, again, so, so this is kind of the, you know, the core idea here. Again, we, we, we are running um, this, this graph neural network. We are exchanging messages. We are imputing um, the vector representations. We are learning vector representations for these different feature types. And we are then in a second step uh, apply a supervised model. When we do this, and so for instance, if we use something like logistic regression as the supervised model, 
we can actually see which of those, uh, you know, at least in terms of embeddings, right, which of those embeddings contributed the most to the logistic regression model making a particular prediction. And then we can kind of track that back to the particular feature type um, and even to the particular neighbors that might have been especially responsible for, for this type of imputation if the data was missing. So it, it provides a particular you know, a way of, of interpreting also um, the, the behavior of, of this, this imputation method and the way that the, then the classifier actually works in the end. Um, <clears throat> I should say that, you know, um, this is something, and I, I'll mention this in a second, that we have actually integrated in a larger uh, bioinformatics pipeline. And again, um, uh, this was done by, um, you know, mostly by uh, Brandon Malone, who has done the bulk of the work of actually putting all of these different pieces together and building this bioinformatics, uh, uh, you know, software really. Um, and one of the things that, that we then do is we want to, um, yeah, we want to essentially predict how likely a particular new antigen would uh, produce uh, an immune response, right? And so um, this is a pretty heterogeneous data set. I mentioned this before, it's coming from different studies. And here, what we do is we are comparing our embedding propagation uh, framework to other methods, such as for instance, gradient boosted trees or convolutional neural networks, which have been demonstrated to work well on similar problems. And we can show that um, for this type of prediction problem, so again, predicting or categorizing uh, immunogenicity um, that our approach, uh, you know, works uh, quite well and statistically uh, significantly better than, than other uh, methods. Um, and uh, we also, um, you know, did this essentially, so you can think of it in this pipeline, what we do is, you know, we are collecting essentially uh, additional data modalities. So this is really expensive. I, I mentioned this before. It, in, it includes things like whole exome uh, sequencing um, and RNA sequencing, uh, usually from blood samples or biopsy. Um, and then after treatment, we check, you know, what is the T cell response, right? Um, and, and here, uh, so I mentioned before, you know, that we are doing this as a, as a, as a ranking. So wh why are we ranking uh, peptides? Well, the reason why we are ranking peptides is because um, what, we, what we then do with this ranking is we give it to a company who then, uh, you know, essentially creates, uh, you know, viruses that, that then, you know, carry the information of this peptide and, and hopefully stimulate the immune response in the patient. And of course, you know, you, you don't want to include all possible epitopes uh, that you can find, right? So you want to kind of narrow this down to a smaller number of epitopes. And so this is typically in the range of 20, 25. Um, and so that's why it's a ranking, right? We want to kind of find those um, epitopes that um, are most likely to elicit a, a reasonable immune response. And we evaluated this uh, um, with uh, you know, patient data. And uh, what's nice is that we could also show that we, um, we can find additional um, uh, epitopes uh, that would actually be missing if we would just look at uh, methods based on, for instance, binding predictions, right? Um, like net M MHC or something like this. So this is something that 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 we are um, yeah that, that we're currently working on. Uh, I should also mention, and again, I think this is you know maybe something that yeah that that doesn't happen so much is that you know, so this uh, you know bioinformatics pipeline that, that, that you know we we have this graph-based machine learning method as a, in, at the core of it that this was actually approved also by FDA and EMA and is currently used in uh, in clinical trials. So we are currently in in phase one clinical trials. Um, this was also, uh, you know, published. Um, and again, uh, this is uh, work. I want to, you know, plug the name again of um, mostly of, of Brandon Malone, who who has put uh, this this uh, pipeline together here. Okay, so so this is to, uh, kind of to show you that, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, graph-based uh, relational learning really can make a difference. Um, I, I wanted to to also mention that, um, you know, one of the areas where we apply this um, is in uh, um, yeah, gene regulatory networks, uh, you know, in, with gene expression data where you usually have, you know, high P, uh, small n kind of situations um, and where you probably also want to group, um, you know, the um, essentially the genes into clusters before you apply a machine learning method. And here also uh, just something I wanted to mention, um, this type of graph, this, this type of graph neural network approach 
that essentially uh, exchanges these you know messages between the nodes and then kind of clusters implicitly the nodes has has worked uh, uh, quite well. All right, and then um, you know finally um, I'm, I'm probably finishing a bit earlier today. Um, so we we also uh, I mentioned this before. Um, so if the graph is is given, right, that, that's great. But in many cases, the graph isn't actually given. Um, and so, for instance, the, the the graph might be noisy, right? Or you you might uh, use a particular if, uh, you know similarity measure to to create an affinity graph. But you're not hundred percent sure if if that's actually the be the best graph that that you can find, right? Um, and so one of the, 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 the research um, uh, projects that, that we are working on is to actually try to learn um, the graph structure at the same time that you learn um, the graph neural network. So for instance, what you see on the slide here is you, you might have you know, a particular data set that where the, you know, the data points are situated on a, on a manifold. Um, and what typically happens is, as I mentioned before, you're constructing um, the graph uh, you are training then in the, and so this is the first step, right? You, you're constructing the graph on top of this using some similarity measure between the, the, the input features. And then in the second step, um, you are you know, applying uh, a graph neural network or some other method to, uh, to perform node classification, to compute essentially these, these vector representations of the nodes. And as I said, so, so one of the interesting things I think is to actually you know, kind of incorporate both of these steps that are usually uh, performed, uh, you know, distinctly, so, so individually, uh, to actually combine these two different steps into one step. And I think that that's a really exciting area of research is, uh, which also touches on, you know, the notion of discrete continuous learning is, you know, how can we actually do this? So how can we induce and update and improve um, the structure of the graph? How can we discover structure in, in unstructured data initially, right? Um, while training an end-to-end -end pipeline that then actually performs, for instance, uh, you know, through a, a graph neural network, uh, a node, classif node classification problem. So I think this is something that, um, yeah, I think is a really uh, good, uh, nice, nice uh, recent research area here. Okay, yeah, and so um, that's it uh, from from my side. Um, uh, let me know if you have uh, any questions about this work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. This was a very clear and very fascinating talk. Thank you very much for that. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. Um, so would anyone like to start from the network? Giovanni, please. Hi, yes. So first of all, thank you. I found it really interesting uh, and a very fascinating talk. The question that I have is actually related to the top left of the slide, because I was just thinking that this application of these embedding propagation would be uh, quite amazing for patient data, because often there's the case of uh, missing data on some of the features that we could have and so on. Uh, well, to summarize my question, uh, in the applications, for example, as the patient network on the top left, we would want to extend that model to new data. How do we introduce new nodes into the graph and then use the previous setup to make new predictions? Yes, this is a this is a really good question, uh, uh, and it's a question that comes up also a lot actually in, in 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 the you know when we actually you know present this work to 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 people who might be interested in using it, right? So, do you have to retrain um, the network uh, over and over again? When you're actually adding new nodes to the graph, right? So, so this is uh, in the in the machine learning community. Oftentimes, uh, so the, the the terms that I use there is like the tran transductive learning, where you assume that um, you know the nodes are already part of the graph, and so all the patients are already there, right? When you train your model, uh, and the other one is where you train your model and then you're getting new nodes, um, you know, new patients in this case. Uh, you know, how do you update without retraining the entire model, right? And so uh, going back, so, and, and there are ways to do this. It, I should mention that um, this is something that we actually did evaluate also in our paper here um, with embedding propagation. And why is embedding propagation especially suitable here? Because what you can do is when you add a new node is that you simply, you know, you're simply sending now. So you, you, when you add a new node, you also know the connections to the other nodes, right? So that's the assumption. What you can do now is you can now just apply the aggregation function, right? Uh, 
once. So what you do is you apply um, the, you know, the, 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 essentially the learned, the functions H and G that I mentioned before, right? So these, these uh, usually projection functions on the features of the new patient, right? So you get this vector representation. And then you simply choose. And, and so instead of, um, you know, learning this vector representation, you just take the aggregation of the, of the neighboring nodes. So the, vec the aggregation of the vectors of the neighboring nodes and use that as the feature representation of the new patient, right? Um, so, and, and this is something that we tested also empirically, and it turns out that this works extremely well. Um, I should mention though that, you know, this is, a sh this is for sure a shortcoming of, you know, of, of this approach, because as, as you said, you know, um, this might work for a few times, but at some point you have to retrain, right? You don't want to add, you know, 50% of more nodes, let's say, and, and, and don't retrain your, your model. And so this is for sure a shortcoming. And some people are you know, also thinking about how to do this, this kind of updating of the model in a more efficient way without retraining everything, right? So maybe just retraining locally or, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Thank you. So yeah, next, so. thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, Mat uh, Matthias. Uh, Volker Therese was next. Yes, uh, uh, Matthias, uh, yeah, very, very interesting talk uh, and uh, great results. Um, and uh, yeah, knowledge graphs, of course, are also um, intensely used uh, in my team at Siemens and uh, the LMU. I think it's a very nice uh, general representation for, for data. Um, one question I had uh, when you talked about the combination with uh, rules. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure if I completely uh, followed uh, everything, but uh, I think there's a lot of recent work where uh, people apply some type of uh, rule learning in context of knowledge uh, graph or triple prediction and they're getting uh, quite good results. Um, yes. And, uh, but, um, but, so my understanding is, or my feeling is that they get uh, like, uh, the results are quite good first, that's very important, but they get a lot of rules, no? like not just one, they get maybe thousands or something. And, yes. and then the combination of these rules gives you a very good performance. Um, yeah. Uh, can you comment on that? And also the terms of interpretability of these rules? Mm -hmm. Yes, so, so the current status I would say is that actually, you know, rule, yeah, purely rule-based methods are actually catching up at the moment. So there have been a couple of uh, recent publications where, um, yeah, essentially just using rules. So without even machine, I mean, without, you know, em embedding anything or, 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 or using fancy machine learning um, that they can actually, for some of the knowledge graphs do extremely well. That's, that's what you already mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. um, and typically what these methods do is they choose, um, so they, they also have an internal ranking of the rules, right? So uh, usually, and this is something that you can also see here. So this is the, pro usually these rules are probabilistic in nature, right? So they say something like, in 90% of the cases, if the, um, the body of the rule was true, so the left side here of the rule was true, then also the right side was true, right? Mm -hmm. And now you can essentially internally rank, you know, how, how confident we are that particular rules are true. And then you can kind of start by just applying the rules that you're extremely confident in, right? And this is essentially what these methods do. So this is their way of dealing with a lot of rules is they kind of internally rank them and then only apply the top rules, the top, top rank rules, right? Um, I, I personally, so this is one side, so they're catching up, I think. On the other hand, you still do have knowledge graphs, and this is also what we observe, where embedding-based methods, so the, the, the type of tensor factorization methods, right, that, that, um, that, that you know, also is coming out of your lab, um, that they, they still outperform uh, rule-based methods, mm -hmm. right? And so our uh, stance here is that we, we should try to combine the two. Right, yeah, yeah. and one one and, and there are now a couple of uh, proposals here, and, and and one way to do this is to really simply, um, you know, use a, a probabilistic model. Like for instance, uh, what we use is a product of experts. So we essentially just have, you know, uh, you know, we we get a score from uh, the rules. So the rules tell us, you know, we believe that this triple here should be scored really highly, and we get a score from the embedding method. And then we just combine these two probabilistically, mm -hmm. right? We just say, well, you know, uh, if, if, if both of them give us a high score, then, you know, the overall score should be higher. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's something that works extremely well and is also uh, interpretable, right? So you can actually then look and see, okay, these rules actually contributed to, to the prediction of the method, 
So, okay, so, so you can select some of these, one, let's say 1,000 rules and say for this particular prediction, only these five or so. Were, were yes, exactly. It's, it's, okay. it's specialized for a particular prediction, right? So you, you get these two rules were the ones that are really important for that particular prediction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you. Siam was next in line. Yeah, hi. Uh, so thank you very much for the talk. Um, so when you were presenting the context at the very beginning, the first application that you showed was the classification of entire networks. So where many networks are, are the impute and then you want to classify the networks entirely. So could you elaborate a little bit on methods to do that? So for example, uh, are they mostly supervised or unsupervised or do you know some names of such methods? Yes, so, so let me actually go, go back to the slide just to provide a bit more vis visual context. Um, so uh, this one here. Yeah, so, so again, yeah. So the question is, you know, what, what because I, just, I didn't cover this really in my talk, what do you do if you want to actually learn representations for entire graphs, like for instance, chemical compounds, right? And so um, one way to do this, and this ba is based essentially on, on the, uh, the, the graph neural network presentation that I had in my talk, is that you learn vector representations of the nodes in the graph first, so to speak, right? And then you globally aggregate the vector representations of the nodes into one vector representation for the entire graph, right? So, so and, and you can do this also end to end. So for instance, right? Let's say you apply what I explained in my talk, right? This, this kind of message passing graph neural network, what it ends up doing is it's computing uh, 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 vector representations for the nodes of the graph, right? And then instead of stopping there, what you do is you say, well, now I take the sum or the average of these vector representations, right? Which then gives me one vector representation for the entire graph. And then I apply some loss function. For instance, if I want to classify graphs, right? I apply a loss function that says, you know, this molecule is toxic or whatever, and, and this one isn't, right? And, and this is the most kind of, let's say, naive way of how you could use uh, standard graph neural networks that typically compute node representations also for, uh, for, for graph classification. But this is just one way which builds on what I presented in my talk, right? There are other ways to do this. For instance, graph kernels are you know, one prominent example where, and in my opinion, still you know, not at all outperformed, I think, by, by, by graph neural networks. It's, it's, this is a very controversial topic because oftentimes also you know, these benchmarks are not very meaningful, I think, sometimes that, that, that are being used. Um, so I think you know, graph kernels is another good choice. And then we've also worked on a couple of other methods. And of course, like always in machine learning, this very simple example that I gave you of kind of averaging the vector representations of a graph neural network, now more sophisticated ways of aggregating information right from the node representations into a graph representation have also been proposed. Like for instance, a form of differentiable clustering, right? Where you kind of hierarchically uh, cluster more and more and then end up with one vector representation. So this is what's called diff pool. It's like, it's, it's like a particular approach that was proposed. Um, so there are many different ways of, of doing this. Um, and I think the first, the, what I would try is graph kernels or a graph neural network with some simple aggregation function on the, on the node vectors. Okay, yeah, I, I will think about it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matthias. So um, there's one question on Slido and then Rime from the, from the network in this order. Um, so Stefan on Slido asks, what if not a node is added to the data, but a new feature dimension modality, is there an easy way to extend the graph without having to rebuild it? Yeah, also, also a very good question. And I think here the answer is at the moment, no. Uh, if you, because what, you know, what, what, a, what a graph neural network really does, it, it, it learns um, a mapping from the, the feature space, so associated with the nodes, right? From the feature space to this embedding, right? And uh, if you don't have a particular feature at all part of the training, uh, then it's, 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 it's not possible to just add this uh, after the fact. So I think that is something that where you, you, so if you add new feature, so completely new feature types, right? Not, not just that for one node, you, you suddenly get a new value or something that's possible. But if you're adding a completely new feature type that you didn't have before, then I think you really have to retrain. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Now Rime is next. It's a question from inside the network. 
Hello. Thank you, Matthias, for the nice talk. That was really amazing. So uh, I'm actually uh, working also on um, uh, this kind of problems applied to clinical data, however, uh, and have one question concerning the way you chose to represent the vector representations. So you mentioned you have uh, one vector representation for the available data and another for the missing data, right? So I was wondering, have you tried one um, architecture with only the available data vector representation? And if you did, what is the performance you got? Uh, and the second question is, uh, how is it different, uh, the vector representation of the available data from the missing data in your case? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the first question is, you know, did, did you compare so by, by, you know, I mentioned in my talk that, you know, what we do is we kind of distinguish, um, we, we, we separately learn a vector representation for the available data for each node, right? And for the missing data. And the question was, so if you don't do this, right? Ha so if you just pretend, you know, then, you know, there is, everything is there, or, you know, you just use some sort of um, standard value for, for missing stuff. Uh, did you compare? And the answer is yes, we did compare. We also compared actually to standard imputation methods, right? So there is, of course, also, uh, you know, standard ways to impute uh, missing data um, by, by taking certain statistics, for instance, of the, of the features that are actually available, so the, the values that are actually available. Um, and we did compare uh, to, to these, um, you know, to these other methods, and this worked significantly better. So, so kind of separating essentially the yeah, the, the missing and the available features uh, worked uh, uh, really well. Um, the second question is, so how does this, how does this look like, right? So, so um, th this is a bit of a difficult question to answer, um, but I, I, I would say what, what really happens is that um, um, you, you, because you're doing this contrastive loss, right, between every node and the neighboring nodes, what happens is that you are kind of, you know, uh, propagating information from the neighboring nodes and their missing data, and also the data that's available into this missing feature representation. So essentially what you're doing is you are, you are kind of have a, a flow of information from the neighboring nodes into this uh, vector representation of the missing data. And, and that's really, I think, what, what, uh, what makes the difference. But it's, it's an intuition that I have, right? It's not something really quantitative that I can, that I can give you here. Does it make sense or? All right, yeah, thank you a lot. Thank you. Now, I would have a few questions, Matthias. Um, we, we have done a lot of research on, on graph kernels, as, as you mentioned, and there are some related concepts between these two fields and we made some empirical observations in about limitations of graph mining. And I wanted to ask you whether you, whether you experience the same in, in graph convolutional networks. So one thing is, um, the Weisfeld-Lehmann kernels also use this neighborhood aggregation scheme. And what we observed in practice is that the depth of that scheme, like how often you repeat the aggregation, how deep you go when unrolling the graph, as you, as you called it, that this depth is not very deep. It's usually in, the, in, in applications, I haven't really seen examples where you have to go beyond level three, often level one, level two is already sufficient to get the best uh, predictive performance. Now, so my first question is, have you seen examples where you where one should go much deeper? Uh, it's, a, it's a very good question because uh, similar to, to what you mentioned about graph kernels, also in, in, in graph neural networks and graph convolutional networks specifically, usually the best choice is to have depth too. So, so when you do this aggregation step that I mentioned, this unrolling, right, you only go up to the two hop neighborhood. Uh, of, um, of, of, of each node, right? And this typically works the best. People have tried to go to three, four, five, and usually that, that doesn't work well. So you, you see how, how your performance actually de degrades, right? Um, and I think, uh, but, but, but there, there is recent work who tries to kind of look at this more from, again, from a methodological point of view. So is it maybe that we need for instance, residual connections, right? Uh, so, so like what people have done in, in deep neural networks for images, right? Like these, these residual shortcut connections, 
uh, should we also maybe try to use those in, in graph neural networks, right? Because maybe there is some sort of vanishing gradient issue or whatever going on, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so there is a lot of work in this area. Um, I personally, uh, um, my personal point of view is that it really depends a lot on the type of graph, right? And typically what we see in, so this is kind of the irony, right? So the typical uh, benchmark data sets that people use in graph for graph neural networks, which are these citation networks, Cora and Cites here, right? They typically have this, what's called the smoothness assumption, right? So that, um, you know, things that should be classified in similar ways are actually close to each other in the graph. So if, if you actually apply then a graph neural network, what's happening is, is, is you're kind of making the vector embeddings of things that are close to each other in the graph similar, right? And then because of this assumption or, or, or this property of the graphs, the things that are the same, have the same label in the end, are close in the graph, you are doing really well, right? Even if you're just using depth two or one. Um, and, and so I think what is really missing is to find really good, uh, so, so it's really a bit of a data issue, uh, I think a benchmarking issue is that I'm pretty sure there are graphs where, you know, distance is not necessarily, distance in the graph is not necessarily indicative of same label, right? Where you have, for instance, in, and I think this is actually something where the biomedical domain can also maybe contribute something, where you might have, you know, a big network and the, the labels are completely different in different parts of the network, right? So, and, and they are, even if two things are close to each other, they might have a different label, right? And, and I think this is kind of what's actually missing. Um, and if that is something that, uh, you know, we see more, so different types of, of graphs really that have different properties, then I think also going to further depth and having uh, the ability to propagate from further apart, right, of the graph can actually be uh, beneficial. Uh, so it's, 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 it's a bit of a, I think really a, a yeah, what type of graphs are really used for these benchmarks, right? Yes, I agree. I, I think these cases can exist just in their relative frequency compared to the other ones where neighborhood implies the same label is so much lower in, in the applications that I'm aware of that it's not so, so easy to find them or to find them in large, large numbers. Thank you very much. So I, I fully agree with what you said. Um, another aspect you mentioned here on this slide 30, but also in your outlook on, on slide 37, this construction of the similarity graph. So I've also looked at a lot of applications of this, this in bioinformatics and very often, and I came to, to very similar observations as you did. Um, and very often I asked myself and I also ran experiments checking, what if you skip the graph altogether? If you just take your input data yeah. and you compute a similarity matrix on it or a kernel matrix or whatever you want to call it and you do your learning directly on that and the and you you get rid of the of the intermediate step of defining a graph on it i i have seen many examples where the intermediate graph is not um really necessary you could just learn it on the full similarity matrix as well so in light of this i found it very interesting in your outlook that that you you make the same observation but come to a different conclusion namely that one should learn the graph the intermediate graph end to end um, yes so so this is a really a great question and it's actually something that you know it would it opens the door to a lot of uh, related topics in in kind of discrete continuous learning so the question for to me boils down to why do you need to create a discrete and sparse structure to begin with right why not keep it dense uh, and have, even if it's tiny, have all of the weights there, right? Have it essentially be a dense, uh, fully connected graph, so to speak, right? Um, and then just uh, train this, right? Then, then we don't even have to worry about, uh, uh, you know, uh, inducing or finding the right graph structure, right? So there are a couple of possible re rebuttals essentially to this, right? One is um, actually, and this is maybe a bit counterintuitive, is actually efficiency. So when you actually introduce a sparse structure uh, and you use sparse matrix multiplication, you can actually compute uh, this much, much faster than if you have a dense uh, matrix. So this is surprisingly one of the things, right? That if you, if you actually learn sparsity, then you are more efficient if you're, if you're leveraging the sparsity more meaningfully, right? So this is one answer. The other answer, and this is something that we actually answered in one of our papers is in some cases it does actually perform, so the accuracy, right, is actually better if you actually learn a dense, uh, sorry, a, a sparse representation, right? So that's the second one. And actually, interestingly, uh, we just discussed this in our group recently, 
there are now an increasing number of papers, uh, also even in, in reinforcement learning in other areas, where actually the latent code is actually learned to be discrete. Uh, and it's, there's something about uh, some sort of compression is happening, right? If you go to a discrete space, um, that could be potentially superior than if than having just you know a continuous uh, essentially space where you just have you know different types of larger and smaller weights. Um, and then the third one is actually, and, and this is something that I find also quite you know makes sense to me, is interpretability. So for instance, I mentioned uh, you know um, gene regulatory networks, right? So you could treat you know uh, the the measurement, the, the gene expression data as one big matrix and you don't really care if there is a graph there, right? You just use it how, somehow downstream to solve a particular problem, right? But if you actually then do this learning, so if you induce a particular structure on top of the genes, for instance, in this case, right? You might, first of all, be able to include domain knowledge that you might have, right? So you might actually have particular inductive biases that you can in induce there. And you can actually look at the resulting structures and you can see, ah, okay, yeah, so here my algorithm decided that there should be an edge between these two genes, for instance, right? And you can kind of take a yeah. look at it. And that's maybe a bit more interpretable than saying, yeah, my, my method assigned a weight of five, you know, to this pair of genes and, and a weight of 0 0.1 to this one, right? So I think there are, there are several potential answers to this. And again, it goes back to like always in machine learning, in the end, it boils down to what do you need in your application and what's the what does the data look like and what works? I will, I, but I agree with you, it shouldn't be always the answer. You, you should learn this or you should have a graph. Sometimes it also works perfectly fine to just not even care about the graph, right? To just treat it as a dense matrix, essentially. Thank yeah. you, a very good answer, very good yeah. answer. <laughs> um, and a very inspiring talk and introduction to this field. So many thanks on behalf of the entire network and, and the YouTube audience for your presentation, Matthias. It was a pleasure to have you here. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. It was, it was fun. And uh, thanks for the invitation again. And we send a round of virtual applause to you. <laughs>